how did you get into voice acting? Ooh, okay. So my mom is a voice actor and in more recent years, she's kind of gone into, you know, really professional voice acting. She's gotten a lot of um, work doing voice acting. Um, and so for background contacts, my parents are artistic directors at Sudamani in Bali. And um, also sometimes directors at Gamalan Sakarjaya, which is in Berkeley, California. And um, so that's kind of like their home base of work. Um, but my mom kind of was like, you know what, I'm gonna branch out and I'm gonna do voice acting. And then she started this career for herself, which is amazing. Um, and so that's how I kind of um, first it was introduced to it, like, oh, through my mom's work. And then through k Bridge of Spirits, essentially. This is my first like professional debut uh, for voice acting and it's really exciting. And so, uh, yeah, me getting into k is kind of a, a different story, but uh, <laughs> that's a little bit of how I got into voice acting. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask, how did how did that role of k come about? Oh yes, okay, so this is a fun one. <laughs> um, so Jason Gallaty, as you know, is the composer for k Bridge of Spirits or one of the composers and he wanted to incorporate Balinese gamelan into the score or Indonesian gamelan into the score. So he reached out, I think, to GSJ in Berkeley um, and GSJ referred him to my parents. And uh, my parents were like, you know what? Like, this is an interesting opportunity. Um, my my parents were, it, my mom was skeptical at first. She was like, I don't know about this, you know, like video games. Cause we were like, not really a video game family. So we didn't really know the spectrum of the kinds of video games that were out there. And so they were really nervous in terms of the use of gamelan because sometimes gamelan is used in really inappropriate ways, in really kind of disrespectful uh -huh. ways. And um, we don't want that to happen. And so my mom sent a whole like intro to Balinese culture <laughs> thing to Jason and to Ember Lab. And she was like, if you can, you know, follow these rules and these requirements for being respectful to our culture and respectful to our instruments and our music and our artists, then we're open to having a conversation. And Ember Lab was like, great. And we were like, all right. And so um, that kind of sparked the conversation. Uh, and then fast forward, Jason and Mike came to Bali and they did some research. And then we recorded a lot of the kind of a lot of samples for the score in Bali with our musicians because all of, uh, most of our musicians for Sudomani, actually all of them are in Bali right now, are active members. And so those are the strong musicians. They're, they're professional musicians that we wanted to have on the score. And so um, Jason and I came to Bali to record them. And we it was just a really fantastic collaborative process. And so um, I was also in that process. I was uh, mainly a vocalist. I also practiced the pieces, but um, I was mainly recorded as a vocalist. And so that's kind of how we were introduced to Kind of Bridge of Spirits. And then sometime later, um, we get a call from Josh and he's like, hey, like, would you be interested in reading for the game? And I was like, oh, yeah, like, I don't know what that is. Like, sure, <laughs> you know, like, that'll be fun. Like, I'll just try. Maybe they'll cast me as like a rod or something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we, you know, did some Zoom meetings. We did some, they like sent me some scripts and I was like, oh, this is fun. They're like, yeah, so they're like, just read for Kana. And I was like, okay, I'm like, what a fun audition. <laughs> like, yeah we kept recording and then we just kept recording. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> like, hang on. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is late. <laughs> so then um, they decided to go with me for k and Bridge Spirits. And so um, I think from their perspective, Mike had come back to Bali and they were still looking for Kena. And Mike told Josh, he was like, I think I, you can do it. Like she doesn't have a lot of experience in voice acting, but um, she's a performer. So I dance and I sing and I play music and I was there for a lot of the music process, which meant that I have a, a, a connection already to the score and a connection to the story. Um, and also the cultures in the game are based on cultures that I'm a part of. So I'm Japanese, Javanese and Balinese American. Oh, right. And so um, it was pretty cool. Like my mom is Japanese and Javanese and my dad is Balinese. And I know that they've drawn some cultural inspiration from Japan and also from Bali, also from other parts of Indonesia. Um, and so in that aspect, like I did feel really connected to the game and to the theme and the story um, because we also have such a strong connection to our spirits in Bali. I'm more familiar with my Balinese culture. So we have a lot of you know connections to our spirits and a lot of respect for them. And so I think that also was helpful in terms of finding the character of Kena and like, and like, them giving me a chance <laughs> and josh was like okay mike thinks like i use good so like let's go with that year 
<laughs> I didn't realize that that conversation happened. <laughs> but um, I'm really glad that it did. I thought, I honestly thought it was going to be like some rock or like a rot or a tree or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was kind of a surprise. <laughs> it was really crazy. <laughs> That's um, a little bit of a, yeah. <laughs> so you've you've touched on like how the game is kind of it has a connection to Balinese culture. Um, mm -hmm. How important was that? Was getting across like elements of that culture with the music? Oh, I think it's so important. Like in Bali and in many many other parts of the world and everywhere in the world, actually. Music is such a core part of culture, um, but like, especially in Bali. In Bali, you can drive from one end of the village, sorry, of the island to the <laughs> other end of the island. And in every village you pass, you can hear gamelan. Um, and that is, I think, really, really special. Um, and there are all sorts of different kinds of ensembles, right? There are little girls, there are little boys, there are adult women, there are adult men, there are competitive groups, there are uh, village groups, there are, you know, it's just like, everybody has a chance to be involved in gamelan if they want to. And it's, something that should be really accessible to people in Bali um, and you hear it everywhere you hear it at uh, perf uh, sorry regular performances right regular competitions and then you hear it in the temple ceremonies you hear it at 2 a.m. when there's quiet and there's nobody watching when you hear it at birthday celebrations you hear it at um, kind of like our version of a bar mitzvah uh, or you know like those are kind of our um, ceremonies for reaching adulthood, but you just hear it everywhere at cremations, at, it's just everywhere. And so I think everything that we do in Bali is so connected to our music. And if people are going to draw from Indonesian culture, especially from Balinese culture, there has to be an element of music to it that also connects to our culture, but in a way that makes sense and in a way that is respectful. Because like, as you, yeah, as you know, probably, um, it like music for a funeral is different from a music for a wedding, right? Yeah. One would think, you know? Yeah. And music for a wedding is different from what you might hear in the temple, which is different from what you might hear at a birthday. So it's like all those, it's like there's so many nuances to Balinese music that might not be apparent to non Balinese or non, uh, or people who don't study Balinese music really seriously. And so sometimes like it's misrepresented or like they'll use an instrument that we would only use for like cremations in a different way and we're like ah oh, like uh, <laughs> that might that's not like you know you might want to be careful um so there's a lot of nuance that goes into balinese music and especially how it fits in with our culture so i think yeah like especially if um since ember lab used a lot of balinese cultural uh, inspiration i think the use of balinese music was really really important in terms of getting that feeling across and um really hitting all the right spots if that makes sense one of the things i thought was really really cool and i think other other people especially from bali noticed immediately was when like the spirits are you know coming to the end of their journey yeah. um and then you hear it's like blue right and then there's like this structure there's a shrine and then there's like the gateway the gateway, I yeah. think, is inspired by like Balinese gateways, like Balinese Pura. So our temples have gateways that uh -huh. look exactly like that. And I think that was just so beautiful because like, I'm always nervous when people use imagery from Bali because it could it could mean anything. Um, yeah. But that was just so beautifully done. Um, and like, just to give you a counter example, like of when like it has been used weird was there was like this advertise i like this ad i saw on instagram or something like that this was like a couple years ago and they were talking about like dietary supplements and they were like this isn't some like voodoo black magic blah 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 like that's what the voice are a uh, voiceover said and i was like wait what because first of all voodoo is a whole other thing that like is its own like religion and culture and like that's also should not be like stereotyped but also secondly they use like an image of a rangda so a rangda is one of our spirits in bali and she is a character that like, when she gets really angry, she kind of transforms into this like kind of very, very beautiful, but very scary figure. And we call her Ranga. And so regardless, we always like respect her and she, she's very, very powerful, right? And every village has their own and a lot of temples have their own Ranga and they have different names and different characters. Um, but, like, and we, oh, we also have like just regular rangas for like regular performances and shows that are not sacred. 
Um, yeah. But they had a like a clip of like Rangda in there when they were like saying like voodoo black magic not juju business and I was like that is so wrong like yeah <laughs> they were talking about dietary supplements and they're like it's not like this fake news black magic situation and I was like you don't want to say that like yeah. mm-mm. <laughs> just, mm. and I haven't seen that company since I have no idea what it was like I just was like so annoyed I was like oh I'm not looking at social yeah. media after the day <laughs> um, <laughs> but like that kind of stuff where people like find a picture online or like find a video online and they're like oh I'll just use this but then it's like no there's a lot of context behind everything that you don't understand or that that we don't understand and it's like worth doing the research to make sure we like use it appropriately right so you got to work with your mom on the soundtrack what was mm-hmm. that like oh that was <laughs> it's always a fun time so my mom actually composed one of the vocal pieces in there it's called Sakar Sandat and um I recorded that with her so I like I think she recorded it first and then I recorded it after um and like that was really cool just because it was like we always sing together at performances and things like that like we always have a fun little duet or something and um like it's I don't know like I thought it was really fun to get to work with my family and my, like my dad was composing a lot of the pieces and my mom had composed this vocal piece and I got to kind of record it with her and I think one of the cool things is that like we know each other's voices and so we can kind of add to it yeah. in a way that's complementary, right? Um, but I have to say though, like working with family is always a little bit challenging. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask, did you have any like uh like big creative differences? Or did you get into um, any arguments? Oh, arguments all the time, just because it's fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of creative differences, honestly, not really, because also like my parents are like they've I, I think they're just like masters at their craft. They've been working at this for a really long time. And so like I really value what they think and what they say and what they do artistically. Um, it was more like, yeah, and my mom is a professional voice actor. So like the stuff that she tells me to do is like important for me to do, like to practice this thing or to approach it in this way or this is how you can like do research and this is how you can approach your character you can like watch these things and um and things like that it's just uh, uh, you know like when your parents tell you to do stuff sometimes you don't want to do it yeah (laughs) it's more like that for me like i just like if i look at it now like yes everything that they said it was like yes and i should i should listen to them 100 percent. but like in the moment you know it's kind of hard to like mm-hmm. want to listen to your parents all the time yeah. um, so those are some of the challenges for me um i wouldn't say we had any artistic differences but it was just more like regular family stuff <laughs> yeah no that seems fair enough okay i have to say like the recording process in bali was definitely really cool and i think with um it's a lot of credit to be given to like esther Choi, who worked at ember lab and my cousin Ayu Eka, who work, who's in Bali, and they they've been they were coordinating a lot during that time. Um, but some of the fun things were like we needed the microphones to be a certain height because some of the instruments were really tall. Um, oh, right. and so you like built like microphone stands out of bamboo, and, like put them oh, in the wow. middle of the room. It was really cool. So we like built these really really tall microphone stands, and you just like tied the microphone on it kind of sketchy looking but my uncles are really cool so it just looked like a really fancy bamboo mic stand if you know what I mean yeah. um but when we were building it I was like is this sake <laughs> 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 but it was it was really cool um yeah. and so like yeah there uh now that I think about it like there are a lot of different kinds of instruments that we use of course one of the sets is from North Bali um and another set was from is from our family home in Bali in Sudaman and so yeah. it was really cool to kind of like play around with the different kinds of ensembles and hear the different kinds of music that kind of happen. Um, but it was just like such a cool experience. Like I can't even explain um, to like do all of that with my family. And cause like yeah. everybody in Sudamani is my family, right? But m- most of them are actually my blood, re- like a lot of them are my, my actual blood relatives. And so it's always fun when you can like give opportunities to your family and like enjoy it with them and i think that was like just one of the best parts of this project was just being able to share it with them and uh be on a like be in a video game with my family like that's so yeah. cool like i feel like that's a really unique thing i don't know if other families do that you know 
it does seem quite <laughs> unique. <laughs> yeah. I could be wrong though. I could be wrong, but it's definitely a fun time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Like it's a <laughs> lot of these music is so interesting and is so intricate and yeah. It was fun. We learned a lot of pieces. Oh, and I think they're coming up. Actually, I don't know anything about the soundtrack, but I think they're releasing a Kena soundtrack, like at some point, kind of oh, in nice. its in its own little kind of package. I think the recordings of my mom and me that are prominent in the score were recorded in 2018. Um, oh, wow. So this was from a tour that we were on, and like I think Ember Lab had come and checked us out a little bit while we were on tour doing the recordings for tour but i like didn't know i didn't really know them back then so i can't like really remember but that's kind of interesting because we sampled those like in la um while our group was here so that was really cool so then the, the quality of it was really nice um because like recording in bali is kind of difficult it was just really loud um so sometimes we would record like at midnight but the problem with that is we have a lot of wildlife. So like the crickets are going nuts. Like they just went nuts. They were like, ah, ah, ah. and we were like, why are you panicking? Like what's wrong? So the crickets were like freaking out and then there were frogs freaking out. And then sometimes there'd be a cow. Um, <laughs> it's just like a lot of noise. And then yeah. in the daytime, motorcycles are really, really loud. So we would record in Denpasar and um, it's a super, super busy over there. But we would, you know, have this sound studio and we would close all the doors and everything. And you would still hear like, ah, ah, <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> like, so we'd have to pause and then play yeah. again and then pause and then play again. And that was just like really hard. Um, but those were some of like the challenges. They were like semi foreseen. Like you could kind of, you kind of guess that they would happen, but it's also like, you don't know until like the crickets are chirping really loudly that they're going to be that loud. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that that was, a problem. No. <laughs> so when Jason and I came, Jason brought a bunch of samples that he liked. So he was like, oh, I really like this style or I like this sound. And like he would share a video or audio with us of like something that he found like that was cool. So yeah. what I think was really cool about like Ember Labs flexibility is like, Jason was like, oh, I really want to use this kind of sound. And he played us a sound and it was from Indonesia. I think it was from Toraja, but it was a deaf, right? Um, like what is it called chant so it was like a chant for like yeah. a death right and we were we found it and we were like oh and then we looked it up and we did some research we were like oh this is like a chant for a funeral in toraja so I, we don't know like this is not appropriate audio to use so we took that um kind of sound and that feeling of like it was heavy and dark and we were like you know what we're going to compose something new and so um my parents i think both worked together on this one um but we kind of proposed another chant that was similar in feel, but but definitely not from that area because we're not from Toraja. We don't want to misuse their work. So we were just like, you know what? We're just yeah. going to make a new thing inspired by that feeling. And um, and that ended up being really great as well. I think it was used in, was it? It may have been used in the woodwork fight, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the... Right. So it's like in World 2, I think that's when they used that audio, but it's like a chant. Anyway, like that was like a cool um, example of how flexible Ember Lab was in terms of like being respectful to our culture and what, really willing to adjust. They were like, okay, like we can't use this at all. That's okay. Like I just wanted to yeah. show you this idea that I had and I thought this was cool, but I wanted to run it by you. Like if it's okay to use, like, yay, if it's not okay, we won't use it. Um, and I think that that's just like such an important way to approach using ideas and, and inspiration from different cultures. Cause I know a lot of companies don't do that. And a lot of businesses yes. don't do that. And that's like disheartening when you see something that could have been done really, really well, but ultimately like fell flat or was um, disrespectful mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. Um, and there are a lot of those like in more recent years too. It's not like. It, this ended in the 90s no like there were yeah. things coming out into like 2020 that were bad <laughs> so like that was so this is so refreshing especially in the form of a video game like we never ever ever thought this would be possible and i think for indonesian gamers we have a huge gaming community in indonesia for them it was like yeah. a reminder oh i was talking to um an indonesian journalist and he was like you know like what what do you think in terms of like um 
the shoot i know that this word sorry it's like i have this word in indonesian but i don't and it's like the english is not happening like what is it called <laughs> anyway to like continue your culture <laughs> what's the word <laughs> uh preserve the preservation yeah. of the culture uh, but he was like what do you think in terms of like like how do you think this will uh, i don't know like the relationship between like kena and like pres like preservation of our culture or something like that mm -hmm. i don't know um and i was like you know i think this like having indonesian representation that is really respectful and very clear in different kinds of media including video games is really important because then indonesians can see their culture being represented and they're like hey wait i know what that is and i feel really proud that that's like i know what that is and that's where yeah. i come from and like that's what i'm feeling from people i feel that they're really proud that their music is reflected or their instruments that they recognize and there are um they let so when I was recording for Kena, we recorded these little sounds for the route. Like if they were like, go get that thing, or like go over there. Like, you know, those little things. Yeah. I said some of them in Indonesian and they slipped some of them in the game and the Indonesians found them. And they were like, wait, are we going crazy? Like what's happening? Like there's Indonesian <laughs> in this game. And they were just freaking out. Um, and they were really excited. And I think that's really special for them to be excited about their culture and their language and their, their music. Because I think a lot of the time, like we sometimes we forget about how rich our culture is and how important it is to preserve it. Um, mm. People just kind of look to Euro American West and they're like, oh, we just want to be like that. We want to go over there and want to forget our lives over here. And we want to just be American. And I'm like, yeah. why would you want that? Like you have so many, we have so many parts of our culture that we can preserve and that we can really share with the world. I mean, if people want to come to America, find opportunities fantastic do it but not at the expense of like losing and forgetting our own culture you know and yeah. i think sometimes when people get here we forget or we just don't place as much importance on it and that makes me really sad because we have so many different cultures in indonesia we have like thousands of islands and every single one has a different culture like it's mm. we have so many things to preserve and like we don't have time to be forgetting about them <laughs> like, yeah. literally we will lose it if we forget so I think it helps kind of remind people of how special our culture is. Like people from Ember Lab came all the way to Bali just to incorporate our music. Like that's really special. So yeah. I think like that's what I hope people are in Indonesia are kind of getting out of it is that like, yeah, our culture is important and worth preserving and worth remembering. Cause I think we sometimes forget that. So. That was cool. Do you think... I forgot what my original point was. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, no, I was that was really interesting. Um, do you think that'll influence your work in the future? Like you're gonna try and represent Indonesia and Bali as much as you can and share it with the world like you've done with Kenya? I think so. Like I think honestly, I think like in my future I'll probably be teaching dance and music at some point somewhere. Um and like, it'll be very, I just, I see myself kind of in line with my family with like what we've done for generations. And like, I just feel like that just really fits what I would like to do, but you know, change it up a little bit because I'm also a modern <laughs> liberal activist, so to speak, <laughs> but you know, change it up a little bit. But I do think that that will kind of um, influence what I'll be doing in the future. Like I do want to continue in the arts and I want to dance and I want to play music. Um, and I want to teach. And so all of those things I think are, are, you know, important to me. And I think kind of having the responsibility of sharing a culture like Balinese culture, Indonesian culture, like that's also really cool. Um, Cause, oh yeah, I forgot to, I don't know if I mentioned, but my grandfather who has now passed, my late grandfather. Um, so my mom's dad was the first Javanese gamelan teacher in the US. And I think Javanese oh, wow. gamelan is, you know, in, like it has exploded. So his Balinese gamelan is everywhere. You can find it in most places. And um, so he was one of the first Javanese gamelan teachers here. And so it's kind of like really, and he came to UCLA actually, which is where he met my grandma. So it's kind of, a full, it just oh, wow. feels like full circle for me to be here. Yeah. But I also feel like I want to do what they did um, and like be directors and be teacher. And like, that would just be really cool um, to kind of, continue doing that kind of work I don't yeah. know, it's, it's fun <laughs> it's fun to me <laughs> yeah no sure it must be nice like like you said getting to work with your your family 
and at the same time you mm -hmm. know represent and share and like create stuff mm -hmm. centered around your culture so I'm yeah great. yeah it's it's really cool um and i know like some people ask me like hey is this like actually what you want to do or do you feel any pressure from your family and i'm like honestly no i don't feel any any kind of sort of pressure like there is a lot of pressure for us in our family to be good at the arts period like we just that's the bare minimum it's for us to be really good we can be anything we want we can be doctors we can be professional athletes like anything we want but the bare minimum is we have to be really good <laughs> at this yeah. like art form <laughs> and i was like okay um so it was like the only pressure i felt like i was i'm really really lucky to have the family that i do everybody is open-minded and they'll just you know they'll be like whatever you want to do like we'll support you and so like that's real i don't People don't have that, and especially in Asian families, like it's so rare to have a family who's like all Asian, and for them to be like, yeah, you can be whatever you want, like you can be an artist, you can be an athlete, like whatever. Um, but the, the bare minimum one is pretty standard. Like bare minimum, you have to have good grades and be good at like the art. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's like common. But yeah. Um, yeah, I do see myself in kind of that, um, like in with that trajectory of life. Mm -hmm. My brother is taking a professional soccer route, so he's gonna, he's oh. gonna, you know, have a different kind of trajectory. But I think we both really, really love the arts, and you know, the best part of it actually, I realized, because we were on tour, Sudamani was on tour in September to the east coast of the U.S., and so that's like, what is that, like Pennsylvania, like Virginia, that area, I don't know if you know, but um, it's. The cool thing was like we were on the road for three weeks with the same people, right? But it was like we never got sick of each other. Um, and I realized it was because there were 24 of us. And every day you could talk to somebody else, right? Every day you could yeah. talk to somebody new. And you never get bored of each other. And like that was really great. And I, I, I think if you have big, a, like a big family that's open and loving, like it's just, it's just a really great experience to be able to work with, with family. So you've mentioned you weren't a, a, like a big gaming family. Has this kind of changed that? Like, are you, are you maybe getting more into gaming? Yeah, so I think the perspective on gaming has changed for sure, at least for my mom. My dad, I think he's just like really chill either way. So he's like, whatever you want to do is like great. But my mom, when we were growing up, she like really didn't want us to play video games or like be on electronics all the time. And I think there are, it's just cause like a lot of the popular things had kind of toxic ideals for instance like barbie i know barbie's not necessarily a video game but like we just weren't yeah. allowed to watch barbie because of the ideals and like it's like this picture perfect image of a really really slender blonde blue-eyed girl like like i shouldn't i'm definitely not barbie you know what i mean and like mm. for me to like look up to her might be a problem um just for me culturally too and so like I think it was like things like that and I think the video games that she was familiar with were like oh like she knew that like GTA existed and she knew that like there were all these shooting games and she knows that like in America we have a problem with guns and like yeah. we have a massive problem with mass shootings like it's like I think that kind of was not those were her associations with video game uh with the video game industry she didn't really play a lot so she didn't really know what was out there um but like my brother of course plays a lot of video games he plays like FIFA and, like all this you know everything <laughs> Um, but I think, I think now that like we've had this experience with Kana, I think my family was, is going to be much more open to having more video games and like being able to play and just kind of exploring that world more as well. We unfortunately don't have like consoles right now, but that might change. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, but, it's um, kind of yeah. like opened up more of the, it showed more of the creative side on like mm -hmm. the artistic side of uh, video games. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I just think that like my mom hadn't considered that video games could be different from just shooting games or violent like fighting yeah. games because those were the only things that I think the only ones that she had seen. Um, so I don't know. Um, but I think this experience really, really like changed that for her. She's like, wait, I there's this other world of video games that I hadn't <laughs> even considered. And like there are all these people working to like create really beautiful uh, video games and like I didn't even consider that and so i think like that's that's really awesome <laughs> yeah um but like i always you know like if i went to my friend's house i would play something if I, like, went to my cousin, so i was like <laughs> whatever i could get my hands on i would try but yeah <laughs> it's a fun time. uh so if i'm right you're still you're still a, is it college for you is yes yeah so you're am. still studying 
Yes, I am. I am at UCLA. <laughs> I am yeah. a fourth year right now, so I'm a senior, and I'm on track to graduate in June of 2022. So hopefully that goes well. <laughs> but yeah. what was it like studying whilst working on a game? Mm-hmm. Like you've got some professional work. What was that mm-hmm. like? Honestly, like Ember Lab was just so amazing and accommodating, and um, we mostly scheduled our recording sessions on weekends so i wouldn't have class i wouldn't have any conflicts um and so that was just easy so we would always just schedule it on saturday or sunday for us to just work um, for a number of hours and so it didn't ever conflict with my classes um and the other thing is that we were remote last year right i think most Hmm. most sorry all schools were remote last year (laughs) (laughs) um i just like forgot like pandemic um so (laughs) that was it was convenient because my mom actually had a sound booth in her room. So oh, wow. in terms of recording and like technicalities or whatever, it was really easy because I just had to move from my room to my mom's room, come back to my room for class and then like go to my mom's room to like do any recording we needed. Um, but like overall, I think because it was remote, it was different for sure. But it was really nice, I think, to have a project like that to work on while remote because it was hard for me like it's hard for me to stay in one place like for an extended period of time like if I'm stuck in my house for like you know like we were all stuck in our houses like that was really 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 difficult for everybody and um I think having this project was really nice because it gave us something to focus on that wasn't like our inter-family relationship dynamic that we're like going haywire it was like no there's this other outlet that we can like work towards and um like that was really nice um it never actually like it was never difficult to balance it Cause I think like my school workload was just a different kind of work and Ember Lab was a really fun, like kind of creative artistic outlet. So it, it felt more like that, it felt more like a break, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it was really cool. <laughs> Cause yeah. I also, the other thing I uh, forgot until this year is like to account for transportation. Cause trans- transportation in LA is like so difficult. Traffic is like traffic everywhere all the time. And so <laughs> it's like literally takes half an hour to get anywhere. And from UCLA to the studio, to Ember Lab, it's like about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And so like, there's just no need to travel, like to account for that distance, if that makes sense. We could just like record it as soon as we needed to and then yeah. send it over to them. Um, so it, it was it was definitely like something that balanced out my schoolwork, um, I feel, in a way that like I didn't anticipate. So we would Zoom with the directors, with Mike and and Josh and I would and they would give me some direction and they would listen to me through Zoom and then I would record into my mom's software and then we would package it up in a nice little box folder and send it to them online. Mm. <laughs> oh, nice. um, so that's yeah how we how we did that but it was all remote just yeah. which is crazy. <laughs> so like you said uh, Kane has been your first experience voice acting. Mm-hmm. Um, has it made you want to pursue that as a career? I think, like, yeah, like for some time, I think it would be really cool to be a voice actor um, professionally and like do a lot of different kinds of work. I definitely think that's something that would be really, really cool. Um, I just hadn't really considered it for myself until Kena came along. I was like, yeah, this is like something my mom does, period. (laughs) But that was like where it ended. But now I was like, wait, it's something I can do too. And then like, I can still ask my mom for any tips and tricks she had and have her coach me um and take classes with her and like i think yeah it definitely opened a lot of possibilities for me um and i do want to pursue voice acting for a little bit so we'll see how it goes <laughs> yeah just see okay. where the wind takes you yes indeed um so do you have any new projects coming up uh, or is Ooh. it mainly just focused on college at the moment mm-hmm so right now, yeah, I'm mostly focused on college and just trying to get myself through this year. <laughs> like we're all, we're so close. And um, but like at UCLA, I do have a lot of projects happening. So one of the one of my fun projects is that I am a music director for an acapella group. It's called On That Note Acapella, and um, like I think that's been a really cool experience so far. I've only been director for like three weeks, but still, <laughs> yeah. I'm excited for the year. I'm excited to kind of like take people on a musical journey and um, kind of change things up a little bit in my acapella group in terms of the way we learn things, in terms of how we approach music. Um, Cause I'm very much a Balinese musician. And so I have different 
sometimes a slightly different approach to things, um, but I also have a good a choral background. So that's a fun kind of one of the things I'm working on. And then another thing is Wax Smash. And Wax Smash is a multidisciplinary showcase in my department. So I am in the World Arts and Cultures department at UCLA. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a World Arts and Cultures major in the World Arts and yeah. Cultures slash dance department at UCLA. So dance right. is also in our department. And so we have an annual showcase, which is multidisciplinary. So it means anything on stage. We have music, dance, um, vocal, we have spoken word, um, theater, and we also have a gallery space. So like film, painting, sculpture. And oh. so it's kind of like a really cool showcase that we have. And this year, I think we're, you know, changing it up a little bit, incorporating even more different kinds of media, um, incorporating even more artists than before. And so I'm one of the producers. Uh, for that show and that's like something we're working on and I, I think it'll happen at the end of January so we'll see but that's another one of my big projects oh, wow. <laughs> right now um, but aside from that yeah just school yeah <laughs> just school, <laughs> yeah, just school. <laughs> that's crazy but, um, yeah I just kind of want to go out with a bang um, mm. this year and I know it's kind of hard to balance like how much is too much and how little is like not taking enough advantage of all the opportunities I have at this school. So it's kind of like going to be a something to work on as well, like just to kind of balance my life a little bit better. But yeah, those are some of the things I'm working on right now um, in college, but outside of college, um, I'm kind of taking a pause, I think. So. Yeah, and that seems fun. Yeah. But yeah. it definitely <laughs> sounds like your, your career is going down a very creative path, which is cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think so options. too. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. 